God never stops speaking. God is always saying something all the time. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. My name is Rod Him. I'm Janice. And this is Quick Study Television. It is a program designed to take you through the Bible in one year. Now that's a fast time when you stop and think about it. But at the same time, we paste it out so that you can gain some insight to some of the scriptures. The scripture today is Psalm 19. God never stops speaking. Day and night, the sun, the stars are always saying something about God at different times. Now that's interesting because as you begin to explore this, you'll see in Psalm 119, or actually Psalm 19, that this happens. Well, we'll talk about that coming up. Corey, what are you talking about today? Today we're going to be talking about King David because he's probably the most famous writer of some of the Psalms found in the book of Psalms in the Bible. But you know, there's a lot of people who aren't even aware that David was a real guy. He's a real historical figure. So we're gonna start to deal with that on today's program. All right, David had some problems too as a father. Very interesting. Mm -hmm. What did you study today? The very last verse of Psalm 19. The, okay, the very last verse. Mm -hmm. All right, not the first, the last verse. Last All right, verse. so there we go. Let's get ready, and here comes Corey. One of the most famous writers of the book of Psalms is, of course, King David. You know, there are a lot of people who are kind of stuck in the past. They are skeptical that King David even existed as a person. Now, scholars really don't deny that he existed as a person anymore, and here is one of the first reasons why. In 1993, an accidental discovery would rock the world of biblical archaeology forever. After an archaeological dig at ancient Tel Dan, the team surveyor had been finishing up some last-minute measurements before heading out with the dig's director. Trudging back to the car with her surveying equipment, she stopped for a quick rest. And that's when she saw it a chunk of rock being used as a brick in a recently excavated wall, with what she recognized as a very ancient inscription carved into it. A quick call to the dig director verified that she had spotted something marvelous, what turned out to be an enemy king's victory stela being reused as building material. During the next dig season, two more fragments of the same stela were discovered, fit together, the fragments reveal only a small portion of what would have been a much longer inscription. Yet what can be deciphered is more than significant. A section of the translated text is interpreted to read, And I killed Jehoram, son of Ahab, king of Israel. And I killed Ahaziah, son of Joram, of the house of David. This inscription would have been commissioned by none other than Aram's king, Hazael, who appears in the Bible. Though the Bible clearly displays Jehu as the man who ended the lives of Jehoram and Ahaziah, enemy kings often took credit for acts they did not do. Dated to the year 841 BC, the Taldan Stela, contemporary with the reign of fearsome Jehu, not only verifies the biblical account of Jehoram and Ahaziah's lives, fathers, partnership, and murders, it also was the first discovered non-biblical reference to King David. Less than 150 years after the death of David came a source from an enemy kingdom directly linking the kings of Judah to their predecessor, David. Now, the Tel Dan Stella is by, by no means the only evidence of King David that we have today, the only historical evidence that we have. However, it was the first to bust onto the scene, and it was quite revolutionary. I remember um, uh, even, e even uh, my first time going to see it, it was making a tour uh, in Ottawa, and it was huge. It made so many ripples. I live in Canada, so I traveled down a few hour drive uh, to Ottawa to see this big um, um, Israel Old Testament uh, uh, 
exhibit that was traveling through and I went to the National Museum and it was so cool to see it, but it created a lot of ripples because people just aren't aware. A lot of us don't keep up with current archaeology and current finds, but it is so worth keeping up on because there are changes being made in the field almost daily, uh, definitely monthly and yearly. There are changes being made and, and it, it really affects our understanding. It fine tunes our understanding. So rest assured, we're going to be focusing in on some more artifacts in the recent uh, days to come here on the Quick Study Television program, focusing and showing you how David really was a real person and how his life has been firmly established uh, by archaeology. And, and there's a little bit of debate in some of the finer points, but we'll get into that as well. A little bit later on in the program, we're going to be continuing to study the Psalms and breaking down some of these chapters and trying to understand a little bit more why these songs are even incorporated in the scripture. I thought the scripture was about history and about God. You know, to gather the principles of God's word into a proper parallel is difficult. But David does this in Psalms 19. In fact, there are six principles spoken, five which everyone seems to understand. There's the law, there's the statutes, the precepts, the commands, and the ordinances. The one principle not understood by all is the fear of the Lord. Now, the fear of the Lord is recognized in, in its entirety by everyone or anyone who surrenders to God. Psalms 19 is perfect for displaying the way God's Word works in our lives. We must see the greatness of God to truly understand the absolute Word of God. Psalm 19, verses 1 through 14. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament shows His handiwork. Day unto day utter speech, and night unto night reveals knowledge. There is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. Their line has gone out through all the earth, and their words to the end of the world. In them he has set a tabernacle for the sun, which is like a bridegroom coming out of his chamber and rejoices like a strong man to run its race. Its rising is from one end of heaven and its circuit to the other end, and there is nothing hidden from its heat. The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, yea, than much fine gold, sweeter also than honey and the honeycomb. Moreover, by them your servant is warned, and in keeping them there is great reward. Who can understand his errors? Cleanse me from secret faults. Keep back your servant also from presumptuous sins. Let them not have dominion over me. Then I shall be blameless, and I shall be innocent of great transgression. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my strength and my Redeemer. Psalm chapter 19, verses 1 through 14. I like it. I like this one a lot. It is, of course, the teaching from Psalm chapter 19. It's amazing. And I want to tell you something. This is a great psalm because as we look at it, we see that God is doing something in the stars, in the sky, that relates to us on the earth. And that is consistent with Genesis, which says that the stars, the sun and the moon, and all of those objects in the sky were made for the seasons and made to tell us things. And so we're going to study that today. 
My name is Rod Hembry. You're watching Quick Study Television. Let me tell you that we have a Bible guide. I'd like you to have it. I wrote it. I put it together for you. There's 12 Bible guides in the year. And if you would like the Bible guide on today, we have four points. And that Bible guide, you just write for it. Wait for the address coming up in the program, and we will send it to you. Now, let's slow this down, and let's take a look at this carefully and see what God says. You know, God's always speaking. It's true. And so we look at our review, and our view is wisdom in God's Word. I love that because God's Word is powerful. And our reading is Psalm 18 and 19. If you read those two, you'll catch up with us and stay with us. But our focus today is on Psalm chapter 19, verses 1 to 14. God speaks to us. And He speaks to us from the sky. You say, well, that's interesting. I'm going to go outside and look at the sky. Well, now, hold on. God speaks to us from the sky, and it's as old as the sky itself. And we'll prove it to you. This is Psalm 19, verses 1 and 2. It says here, the heavens declare the glory of God. The heavens declare the glory of God. Wow. And the firmament show his handiwork. Day unto day utter speech, and night unto night reveals knowledge. Wow, there's a great deal of theology right there in that first passage. You see, God never stops speaking. During the day, the sun speaks, and in the night, the stars reveal his plan. This is so important. As we look at the sky, as we look at all of the things that God has made, and even the clouds, by the way, even when it rains, and all of that, God is in the design. God's judgment in the clouds and in the rain and all of that is a result of what? Noah's flood. Very interesting. And we can trace everything back to the work of God and through the stars in the sky, he says, and the sun in the day, God speaks to us. And he says to us, now every person on the planet, every person, doesn't matter what culture you're from, has a sun and has stars at night. And everybody sees it. Now that's important. So you see that God is about the globe. He's about the whole world. He's not about just the west or, or, or just the east. He's about everybody. It's everybody. So we go on to the next verse. In Psalm 19.3 it says, There is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. Their line has gone out through all the earth and their words to the end of the world. In them, he has set a tabernacle for the sun. I love that part. That's a great part. Which is like a bridegroom coming out of his chamber and rejoices like a strong man to run its race in rising from one end of the heaven and its circuit to the other end there is, and, and there is nothing hidden from its heat. Now that's amazing. I'll tell you right now, that's an amazing thing. And God says that the sun speaks daily to his plan. <laughs> time has a beginning and time has an end. If you stay on the earth and you look at the sun, it rises in the east and it sets in the west. Rises in the east and sets in the west. Isn't that interesting? God is speaking to us that time has a beginning and time as an end. God is not bound to time. He is beyond it. And he, time to him is like a capsule and he's standing out here looking at time and we're saying, well, there's the beginning and there's the end, but we're saying, no, it's, it's all out here. And see, that's the important point for us to remember as we consider heaven and all the things. It is important for us to realize what God is doing. And so, beloved, we go on to the next passage of Scripture, which is 7 through 11, and the Bible says the law of the Lord is perfect converting the soul. The testimonies of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. Oh, I love that part. The statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. And the commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. And the judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, yea, than much fine gold. Sweeter also than honey and the honeycomb. Moreover, by them your servant is warned, and in keeping them there is a great reward. <laughs> and with that, we go to the last point we're going to talk about on the taste program. God says that his word converts the soul, 
It makes us wise. It makes our hearts rejoice. It enlightens our eyes. It endures forever. Hallelujah. I want to tell you something, man. God is, knows exactly what he's doing with the word. And when we take the word and make it a part of our daily reading, we take the word and, and we say, we're going we're gonna to read the word every day and we're going to talk to you every day. God, we're going to come to you and, and, and sit here with your word and prayer and we're going to do that. When we do that, God blesses us with his word. He brings his word to us and he says things to us, things that we didn't know before, things that are new, things that are interesting. And if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, if you're somebody who follows God and you've asked the Lord to come into your heart as Lord and Savior, Lord, be God of my life, and then you daily take 15 or 20 minutes and say, I am here to study your word and, and take you, Lord, and it takes about 15 minutes to read the Bible assignments we put in the Bible guide. And you read the Bible guide and you say, Lord, I'm here to listen to you. And God speaks and you pray, read and pray, read and pray every single day. It may take you 15 to 20 minutes to do so. And that's all God asks. And the Bible says here that when you do that, here's a look at it. You, in Psalm 19, read it today. The Bible says he will make you good. He will make you right. He will make your justice strong. And you will be God's soul. Now, as because we are studying right now on quick study through the book of Psalms, we're going to be taking a look at the book of Psalms as a whole and kind of breaking it down and providing an introduction for us as we study through these songs. You know, why are they even here? Um, a lot of us have this idea that the Bible is just a continuous story. So why are these songs here? The book of Psalms has rightly been called the hymn book of the temple. In English, we call it psalms from the Greek psalmos, meaning psalms accompanied with music. In Hebrew, the title simply and eloquently means praises. The 150 chapters of psalms were originally arranged into five sections or books that correspond with the first five books of the Bible. Many English translations still preserve these sections. The authors of the Psalms are diverse, but most of them are from the days of King David. At least 73 of the Psalms were written by King David himself. Probably some of the orphan or unclaimed Psalms were his as well. Other writers from the Levite musicians of his day are the sons of Korah, Asaph, Heman, and Ethan. There are two written by David's son Solomon, and there is even a psalm written much before the days of King David by Moses. His is Psalm 90. Due to the great organization of David in preparation for the temple, it is not a stretch to credit him with the first organization of the book of Psalms. His prowess in ordaining praise and worship can be read about in 1 Chronicles 16 23 and 25. Some psalms were written after the days of King David, so the final organization and structure of the book cannot be fully attributed to him. Some of the psalms speak about the Babylonian captivity, which occurred after the destruction of Jerusalem and Judah. So when was the book of psalms completely finished? Well, sometime shortly after, the Babylonian captivity was ended by Cyrus the Great of Persia. A possible solution is that the Psalms were then arranged by Ezra the scribe. Wouldn't it be great if we just came on television and it was free? But that's not true. The truth is we have to pay for airtime and we are behind in our airtime and I need your help. And that's the only place I go. I don't have some big uh, staple of money somewhere. I just have the daily donations of people just like you. People paying five, 10, 15, 20, $30, some more every month to keep quick study alive. I know it's a struggle right now, but the truth is if we don't continue, we'll have a problem. 
We have people like the NRB channel. We have people like Cornerstone Television, Vision TV, Hope TV. We pay for these time slots to get the, the program on. And so will you help us today? Father, I pray in the name of Jesus Christ that you would speak to people. I don't have anything to do except to ask them. And I ask that they would do so, Lord. And I pray that they would write for their quick study pocket guides because they're original, Father. And I ask in the name of Jesus Christ that you would move on their hearts and help them today. In Jesus' wonderful name, amen. Thank you in advance for considering us and helping us as we move forward to keep this program alive and keep it going every day right here. Thank you for staying with us here on Quick Study Television as we continue to go through the Bible. It is great to have you with us. As we do that next program, I'm going to be talking about something interesting. It is actually God who promises to move on our behalf. Times of depression and times of distress do not stop God. And we'll talk about that next time on the Quick Study Television program. Now, what did you do today? You studied verse 14. What did you do? I took the last verse of Psalm 19, verse 14, and it will be very familiar to many of you at home. I know that it is on our lips a lot because here's what it says. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. The last verse is a beautiful prayer that recognizes the necessary relationship between the thoughts of our hearts and the words on our lips. We can compare that if we want to. We can take that into Romans chapter 10, verses 9 through 10 that say this, If you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Interesting. Confession is made unto salvation. Mm -hmm. So in other words, the Bible, if you go back a little bit uh, and, and you learn, the Bible says that the word of faith that's in your mouth, it is. Yeah. And so in other words, God is putting an emphasis on saying it. That's right. If you believe it here and then you speak it, you will be saved. Then it happens. That's right. And today's world mm -hmm. with, you know, email and internet and everything, nobody yeah. seems to have accountability for what they say. That's right. But God holds us accountable. He does indeed. And sometimes words are, well, words are very easy to express. And sometimes we can pretend the words that we speak aren't truly what's in our heart until we become pressed. <laughs> and a lot of us know that from experience. When you become pressed, some of the things that are deep within your heart begin to come out through your mouth and you realize how far off the mark you are. So it's always good to pray that verse in, in 14. Let the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in God's sight. Lord, let the words of our mouth and the meditations of our heart be acceptable. The words, the meditations, acceptable. Mm -hmm. And I, I thought about that. I, I often yeah. use that line when I pray in yes. church and I pray yeah. publicly and all that, yeah. because it's important that we understand that God listens to us mm -hmm. and what we say affects us. And I just want to say that it's important for people and, and really who are listening to understand that. Mm -hmm. that you need to know that God, what you say has an effect on the world around you. It sure does. And you make the world around you with the words that you use. And so we may have used words we shouldn't have used before. I know I have. Me too. And uh, it's not a good feeling, that's for sure. But you may be in a position where you're ready to finally understand that. And you're finally ready to realize your words are powerful. And you're ready to take it in and say, Lord, forgive me for what I've done. And, you know, you might be somebody who complains all the time because you've got, you know, sicknesses or problems or whatever. And you confess that all the time and make a, a, a big deal out of it. But, beloved, may I say to us, it's important for us not to not to make a big deal out of that, but to make a bigger deal out of praise for God out of the reality of who God is. Because the truth is, if we are believers in Jesus Christ, it doesn't matter. The truth is we have eternal life. And that life, there'll be no disease. 
There'll be no death. Things will be different. And God has redeemed us. And so, Father, I want to pray in the name of Jesus Christ and by the power of the Holy Spirit that you would move on people today. You would move on their hearts. You would let them know that what they said or what they say is important. And I pray, Father, today that you would release them from all of the things they've said about negative things, about people around them and about things around them. Turn their words into the positive. Turn their words into things that mean something. And in Jesus' name, I pray all of this. Amen. Now, that is important for you to understand, but it's also important for you to understand not to ignore words that are negative, like sin. For example, confess your sin and say, God, forgive me, and then God will forgive you of your sin. Very important today. It is important to remember that the Word of God does more than just point to answers. We must understand that the Word of God is that which makes our soul well. As we read it, we ingest the strength of God. We seek the strength of God by taking His Word. How important it is for us to daily read about God and His plan for the earth. That is what Quick Study Television program is all about. Our souls become weak and battered from the momentum of sin. Sin is debilitating and destructive force that keeps us mired in the depression of the world around us. We must seek God daily through His Word and understand and grow. It's interesting, you know, you say, well, who's the Lord of your life? Well, some people would say, well, God's the Lord of my life, but they never really allow Him to make decisions. They just do their own thing and expect God to fulfill their lives. But the truth is that a Christian, a real Christian, lets the Lord be Lord of their life. You make decisions, but under the influence of the Holy Spirit. If you want to make Jesus Christ the Lord of your life, come to Him today and pray and say, Lord, be Lord of my life, I pray today. Oh. <laughs>